So there are good movies. There are great movies. Most movies are kind of middling. And then there are some bad movies. And then there are catastrophes. I think Madam Web falls firmly in the category of catastrophe. But, and I know you feel the same way about this, Bahe, great movies and catastrophes are the most fun to talk about and dissect. Mm -hmm. The middling movies are almost impossible to review because we never have anything to say, really. It's fine. It's okay. It's enjoyable. It's entertaining. We use the same words over and over again. But when it comes to something like this, that is truly, truly special in the worst possible way, it is an absolute joy to review. I don't know if it was because I was prepared for a bad movie, but when I came out of this film, don't get me wrong, it was and is an absolute shit show. However, I wasn't angry. I was maybe disappointed. But most of all, you know what I was? I pitied everyone involved in this movie. No, you're right. And and that's the thing that's actually the most fascinating, right? Because there are a lot of people who get angry at this sort of thing because they're like, well, if you spend that much money, if you spend 90 million on a movie, you have no excuse because otherwise you're just flushing money down the toilet. Yes. I find that I get angrier when I'm talking about a bad Malaysian movie because that actually uses our money. It's taxpayer money a lot of the time that goes towards funding that garbage. And so then I get angry because I have a stake in it, right? I pay my taxes and it's gone into a grant that has funded this thing. With Hollywood, I find that I have less involvement in it And I can take a step back. And I think movies like this are fascinating. And you said pity. That's the right word. It's fascinating because so many things went wrong. Yeah. And so many people and creative conflicts happened to make this utter mess. And that's really interesting. I kept thinking to myself... Maybe this was one of those things. Sony should have taken a page out of the Warner Brothers playbook and just taken a tax incentive hit on this, right? Don't release it and just swallow the loss and just take whatever the tax incentive was. Also, you've got enough good stuff in the Spider-Verse on your slate because you've got part two of Across the Spider-Verse coming out. So that's enough to hold on to the rights. It's not like you don't have anything else because I think how it works is If you own the rights to something, you have to produce a movie every few years or so to maintain the rights. And that's the famous story of Roger Corman being hired to make a Fantastic Four movie because the owner of the rights didn't want to lose it. But actually, he made this movie that was never really meant for release. And it was just this utter cynical train wreck Mm. thing. I mean, credit to Roger Corman. I've seen clips from it. I haven't seen the whole movie. You can find clips on YouTube. Credit Roger Corman. It felt like he was convinced he was doing something great. Like, everyone in it felt all in. Like, nobody was winking at the camera with that Fantastic Four movie. No one other than the producers who funded it. Exactly. You're right. And I think think at this point, we're just speculating that that is the reason Madam Web exists, right? Because... It is a Hollywood thing where if you own the rights to a bunch of characters that don't belong to you in the sense of Marvel, Marvel Comics and Sony, this really weird shared custody thing that they've got going on, you have to essentially make a film every two years, I think, to continue retaining the rights. You're essentially renewing your ownership of the characters every time you make one of these movies. This was not a good movie. (laughs) So before we get into everything that didn't make this a good movie, a quick summary of what it's about. Madam Web is a secondary tertiary character within the Spider-Man universe. 
She appeared in 1980. She is this clairvoyant character that occasionally assists Spider-Man when he goes into multiversal adventures or the story involves something regarding the future. None of the other characters that are featured in the movie are major characters with the exception of maybe Ezekiel Sims, the villain. However, in the comic books, he's not really a villain. He's a Spider-Man ally. He slipped a couple of times in his mission, but for the most part, he is a friend to Spider-Man. All of this has been changed in the movie and kind of rejigged the same way that superhero movies of the 1980s and 1990s used to do, where producers and filmmakers would think, hey, these are interesting IPs and we don't need to care about what's in the silly comic books. Let's just take these characters and tell our own story. Yeah. The history of that has not been very good because almost every time someone has tried to do that, they have failed miserably. Yes. And the reason the MCU was so successful and even Brian Singer's X-Men movies were so successful, that was the first time where people went, hey, why don't we actually look at the comic books and see what fans loved in the first place? Yeah. This rendition of Madam Web is taking the names of characters and then transposing them into a weird mishmash of a story that maybe features some of their characteristics from the comic books, but not all of them, and then trying to do some weird psychological thriller stuff, which has nothing to do with anything. And the end result was this. I prefer the more succinct term of doing whatever the fuck they want, <laughs> because this movie was terrible. And I think if you ever get the chance to watch this film, we're not ones to say don't watch it in the cinema. But if you ever do go watch this movie, I will say this. You are not getting what these characters are. You are getting a real sort of whatever the fuck they want. You know what it is? You are getting draft number 10. Like I always assume that draft one that someone has written skews close to the source material. But then... By the time it goes through studio hands and different executives and maybe a second and third writer, everyone kind of adds their take and it becomes yeah. more and more diluted. And this movie feels like a dilution of what the comic books were. This movie feels like a dilution of what a movie is because there are points in this film where you just go, has no one involved in this film ever made a movie? Because some of these things are terrible. So let's talk about the terrible stuff. Right off the bat, from the opening few minutes, it's very clear that this thing has been chopped up and stitched back together. Yes. And you can tell primarily with the villain, with Ezekiel Sims, with Taha Rahim's character, there are moments where the ADR, which is the dialogue replacement, is so bad that if he's in the background, you don't see his mouth move, but he is saying stuff, which means they have rewritten his dialogue to appease a new edit of the movie. And that often happens when they only have a certain amount of footage, but want to tell a different story and are hoping that they can do that in the edit. There were bits where he would... <sighs> Sorry, I'm just starting to get angry now. There were bits where Tahar Rahim's character was speaking, but the camera was on the person he was talking to. Now, I'm no Oscar-winning filmmaker, but I would assume that you want your camera on the person who's talking. You have a thing called a reaction shot when the other person reacts to something that is being said. However, there were swaths of conversation with Ezekiel Sim, where the camera isn't on Ezekiel Sim. You don't see him. And that is an absolute travesty because Taha Rahim, he is an incredible French Algerian actor. There is yeah. a movie called A Prophet, which is where you might know him from. And it is a fantastic film. And so you take an actor like this and do him dirty in such a way is not cool. It literally sounds like all of his lines were dubbed over. And 
it's something that you will notice. And that's not the widest of seams in this film either. Not even that. There were moments where it looked like he was ADR'd over himself. So there were bits where, again, they would ADR a dialogue in. He's talking to a lady in bed and the camera's constantly on the lady in bed when Tahara him's talking. But there were bits where even that ADR'd part almost feels like it was ADR'd over because you can hear suddenly the room tone changes. Yes. So they've ADR'd over the ADR'd. And I'm just like, how many times did you guys write this film? And then, and then, the most frustrating thing of all, which I think might be a spoiler, but we don't really care because the trailers were so incredibly misleading. None of the action that you see in the trailer is actually symbolic of what happens in the film. It doesn't speak to anything that happens in the film because if you watch the trailer, what you think is that this is a movie where Ezekiel Sims is a bad guy and Cassandra Webb recruits three young spider women to help take him down because Cassandra Webb, Madam Webb, her powers are mental powers. So she's not going to get involved in a big bish bang boom at the end where she kicks ass. She can see into the future. She can maybe telekinesis some things. Maybe, maybe she can astral project, sure. But that doesn't result in a CGI slugfest that superhero movies are wont to do. And so you think, hey, here come Sydney Sweeney, Isabella Merced, and Celeste O'Connor playing different versions of Spider-Woman and Spider-Girl from the comics, and they're all going to team up and take down the bad guy. Nope. The only time we see them in a suit, there are two moments. One is in a flash forward because Ezekiel Sims has some kind of a premonition slash dream, which lasts for seconds. And the second part is right at the very end where Madam Webb has a kind of premonition or a dream, and it lasts for seconds. This is the first pre-origin story that I have ever seen because even Dakota Johnson does not actually become Madam Webb in this movie. Can I just say, I've been editing our interviews with the cast and the director of this film. I'm sorry. No, no, you're fine. This is the first time I've seen a movie that's actually potentially more exciting in trailer form. You might be right. All those things you mentioned, the fight sequences and the the first sort of Ezekiel Sin premonition where he sees the three women fight him and kill him. What you see in the movie is what you see in the trailer. Literally, there is no, maybe three extra shots, seven extra frames potentially, but it's all there. It is the biggest fake out. It's not even a cool fake out. It's not even a Deadpool style fake out. This is just a fuck up. But it feels like the studio and the people who cut the trailers had no idea how to sell this movie. And they sat down in a meeting room and went, listen, the only way we are going to convince these people to come see this movie is Dakota Johnson, Sydney Sweeney, and then maybe superhero chicks. So let's put that in the trailer. Meanwhile, the movie has a completely different pace to it. I disagree. I think the movie doesn't know what pace it wants to be. I think you're absolutely right. The pace changes about three times in the whole film. At least three times. This is the first time I'm going to say her name, but if you're listening to this, please in no way put this on her. I don't know if S.J. Clarkson actually directed this. This feels like it was directed by committee suddenly there were two funny sequences where Dakota Johnson's trying to climb a wall. Spoiler. But the way it's shot, it just feels like, wah, wah, here's a comic. You know, I'm just like, wait. Suddenly, there is a moment which brings the movie to a grinding halt where Dakota Johnson decides that she wants to teach the three girls how to do CPR. She's an EMT. So she wants to teach them how to do CPR because God knows it's going to come back later, right? She doesn't decide to teach them CPR because we don't see that decision made. No. We don't see her telling them, hey, this is what's happening. There was some basic explanation about neurotoxins. But mostly, she just wakes up one morning and goes, hey. CPR time. You need to learn how to do CPR. Yeah. <laughs> it is an important life skill. I'm an EMT. There are three girls here. They probably don't know CPR. Let me do my duty. It's really random. 
there's a real basic setup of like, oh, there are neurotoxins that you may encounter and the neurotoxins may stop your heart and this is how you restart it. But there was no real sort of decision to be like, hey, you know what I need to do? I need to teach these girls a life lesson so that we can all save ourselves in case we need to. No, it just literally fucking happens. She just starts picking up pillows. I was sitting there going, what is she doing? She can't be doing her bed in a fucking motel. That must be stupid. And then suddenly the next thing you see is you see all those pillows wrapped up in a hoodie and she's doing CPR. I'm like, what the fuck? And you're absolutely right. I wouldn't put any of the blame of this on S.J. Clarkson. S.J. Clarkson is primarily a television director. She's a British television director. Madam Web is her first feature film. But she has done some tremendous work on English television and American television. She did six episodes, all six episodes of that fantastic CV series, Life on Mars, way back in the day. She's done House. She's done Heroes. She did Jessica Jones, The Defenders. She did Anatomy of a Scandal, the Netflix show. S.J. Clarkson has some skills, and I don't believe this movie reflects her skill. Now, if you know anything about how Hollywood works, and if you've read some books, and if you've gone into the history of failed movies, for example, I think this might end up being like a David Fincher Alien 3 situation where he had a version of the movie and he made a movie and then the studio felt it wasn't marketable enough or had different ideas about what they wanted that movie to be. And what then happens is the studio hires other editors or other directors to come in and recut and botch up the work. I think that's what happened here, because if you look at the press material that's going out for Madam Webb, there is a very strong focus. And even in the four line synopsis, the word standalone is there. When describing the movie, all of the material calls it a standalone film. And I think maybe they set out to make a Spider-Verse movie, something that fits within either the Andrew Garfield Spider-Verse or the Tom Holland Spider-Verse or whatever, right? And then the shit hit the fan with the MCU and the DCEU and Sony went, listen, let's forget all of this interconnectivity. Let's rejig this movie to try and make it something by itself. But of course, there's only so much they can do because Ben Parker is there and Mary Parker is there. And they've got all of these connections to Spider-Man, but they can't talk about it. So let's remove a post credit sequence if we had one. Let's redo the dialogue so it feels like everything potentially is self-contained. I think the liberal use of the word standalone in subsequent marketing materials feels like a clawing back of expectations. I think they saw the movie and they were like, you know what? We done goofed. I don't think it's a reaction to MCU or DCEU or even Morbius. I think it literally is, this movie sucks, we fucked up. From the article that I read in the Hollywood Reporter of Variety, it looks that they're applying the same thing to Craven. They're calling it a standalone film. I mean, I've got no hopes for Craven, to be fair. No, I've got no hopes either, but... <laughs> I mean, I find it hard to believe that movie after movie, they're just going, oh, no, we done fucked up. Let's make it standalone. Look, you may say that, but we both saw Morbius and they kept making movies after that. <laughs> they made Morbius and then thought to themselves, oh, the internet is loving Morbius. So what we should do is re-release it. I know. What we should then do is make a Craven movie and a Madam Web movie. Dude, I think they just read the room wrong. They're doing another one, dude. That movie that was supposed to star, was it Bad Bunny? I thought that was cancelled. Apparently, he's out of the film, but it's still in production. Oh, sweet lordy, this is beautiful. So, they keep going down this road. And then, of course, the biggest question is, do any of these characters warrant their own film? Are they interesting enough? Are they important enough? Because let's not forget, some of these characters may have had appearances in maybe a few comics, but even Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and Neil Adams, whoever, all of the people who created a lot of these classic characters, even they knew that sometimes these were throwaway characters. 
occasionally a screenwriter may come along and develop them into something far more interesting than they ever were. But for a lot of the time, these characters don't seem to have enough. Just look at The Incredible Hulk. I mean, The Incredible Hulk is a fantastic character in the MCU, but I don't think any screenwriter has quite cracked a solo movie as yet, which is probably why, I mean, rights issues with Universal aside, it's probably why we haven't seen a standalone Hulk movie. However, I would also say that there is only value in a Morbius standalone film or a Madam Web standalone film or a Craven the Hunter standalone film if you're gonna get to Spider-Man. Correct. There is no reason for these movies to exist. And I'm going to get back on my little apple cart and repeat the Joker story, right? Like, I don't think Joaquin Phoenix's Joker should exist because outside the realm of Batman and Bruce Wayne, the Joker character doesn't exist. So why does he have his own film? Not only that, he's not interesting as the Joker. He may be interesting as an incel character in the real world as a kind of metaphor, but that has nothing to do with Batman and you don't have to call him Joker. Exactly, right? So a Craven the Hunter film could work if Craven the Hunter was a bad guy who is, let me repeat it again, who is fucking Craven the Hunter. He, the reason Craven the Hunter exists in the Spider-Man universe is because he's trying to hunt Spider-Man, the one thing he has never been able to kill. That is the point of Craven the Hunter. Madam Web's point is as an ally, as a sub, as a support character to Spider-Man or Spider-Girl or whatever they're called, right? I think that is the point. And I'm happy with a Madam Web origin film. I'm happy with a Craven yeah. the Hunter origin film. However, I need to see them interact with Spider-Man because if not, why am I watching Russell Crowe be abusive to his son? I've seen him do that in enough movies. <laughs> yeah. But also, also, just to go back to some of the truly terrible writing in this film, I haven't cringed as much in a movie. I was watching it and I was literally laughing out loud because it was so unintentionally funny. So many lines felt like they were just shoehorned in because... At one time, this movie was part of a Spider-Verse. Adam Scott plays Ben Parker. And we all know Uncle Ben marries Aunt May. They have to look after Peter Parker because his real parents mysteriously disappear slash die. And there's a great fucking moment in this one where Cassandra Webb and Ben Parker are having a little chat in their rec room because they're EMTs and they just finished a little ambulance mission. And Ben's like, oh, Cassie, I've met someone. And Cassandra jokingly says, because Ben Parker is clearly a player, she goes, oh, what's this one's name? And he just keeps quiet and looks at her seriously. And then Cassie goes, oh, it's serious, is it? And I'm like, her name's May, you fucking idiots. We know her name is May. Say it. Say it. But, but here's the thing. It's the name thing. It's a joke that keeps repeated again later. Later, again, because we meet Mary Parker and there's a whole thing with a name where she's pregnant and they just don't say Peter because they can't say Peter Parker. And I'm just like, for fuck's sake, stop treating the audience like dummies. It's not even treating the audience like dummies. I don't think anybody's leaving the room going, who's Emma Roberts' son's name? Huh? Why so important? What was the name? S Simon is it? No, but they say Simon, not the name. I'm just like, no, why, why even go there, right? Why even do that joke? It's not worth anything. You know what? Like, inside baseball, there's no way you're hiring Adam Scott and Emma Roberts to play Ben Parker and Mary Parker if you're not thinking of something else happening later. Exactly. The movie ends with a fucking... Dakota Johnson monologue about how one day in the future we will all be blah 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 and I'm like nope not gonna happen lady this is not gonna happen but that was also some of the worst line delivery I have ever heard it is cringe dude can we talk about Dakota Johnson now and her inability to act and her inability to do anything to emote to deliver lines to 
Oh, God. And here's the thing, right? Superhero content, whether it's comic books, films, TV shows, have a tendency to be quite cheesy when you read the comics because it's all about nobility and heroism and it's the kind of stuff that modern audiences will roll their eyes at. And yet, I think the success of the Marvel stuff is that they've managed to find a happy balance, whether it's through self-deprecation or wit, humor. They've managed to make that Boy Scout nature of superheroes work. The way Joss Whedon did it in the first Avengers movie, when Agent Coulson is talking to Captain America and he talks about how you need a little bit of old-fashioned these days, I think that was a clever way to put across this idea that here is a superhero that's actually dressed in the fucking American flag. It is the cheesiest thing ever. But it worked, right? Because it made you feel pumped. This takes that cheesiness, puts it into the mouth of Dakota Johnson, who has an inability to deliver any sort of line, and just renders it as garbage. I thought... Morbius was a painful watch made doubly so by my personal and most likely uncalled for hatred of Jared Leto however at least Jared Leto was acting yes you know what you know what I mean like Jared Leto was doing a thing sure it was a thing to the power of Jared Leto here Dakota Johnson is fucking dead fishing her way through this entire film. She checked out. I don't know if she checked out. I think it's just her. You're probably right. She's dead in the eyes, man. Like this is the daughter of Don Johnson who isn't a great actor but has got charisma flowing out of every pore. This she is so dead in her face. I'm reliving the movie now, slowly. But you first see Dakota Johnson in a high-stress situation, driving an ambulance through New York traffic, just weaving in and out, honking the horn and everything. Her face doesn't show it. Nope. She looks like she's going on a Sunday drive, screaming, get out of the way. But her face has got no anger, nothing. Her face has got nothing. She's dead fishing her way. It's fan-fucking-tastic. Is this... The prime example of a Nepo baby. Like, I hated the Nepo baby conversation because I thought it was kind of stupid. Because a lot of the people who were pointed out were actually incredibly skilled in their own right. Which brings us to Dakota Johnson. Maybe Don Johnson had a point when he cut her off When she said, I'm not going to university, I'm going to pursue a career in acting. Maybe Don Johnson knew this is not for you, young lady. Potentially so. You can find a review we did of Cha Cha Real Smooth and me talking about how I had fallen in love with Dakota Johnson. I I was wrong, guys. Guys, I was wrong. Like, Cha Cha Real Smooth was written so fan-fucking-tastically that I fell in love with Dakota Johnson. It's amazing what a good writer and director can do. It's amazing what a good writer-director can do because she's terrible at this. We have an interview with her on YouTube. She's not great there either. Oh, it was rough. Please go watch it. It was so rough. I don't know how you did it. It was rough editing that thing. Blood from a stone, my friend. It was getting (laughs) blood from a stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, movies like this, I enjoy watching as much as something like The Holdovers. Because my brain just goes to a place where I stop watching the movie halfway. Like in my head, I'm already trying to figure out all of the things that went wrong, why these cuts happened, what the studio was thinking with regards to structuring a story to serve their potential sequel endgame. This is the kind of thing that you should watch and should be taught in film school. You can teach Raging Bull and Taxi Driver and Schindler's List and Star Wars and all of that stuff, sure. But man, you got to teach this and Catwoman and Daredevil and Elektra. I think this should be taught in specifically producing courses because this is a producer's problem. This is something where a producer's fucked up because I'm sorry, but this movie 
did not need four fucking writers. Can I tell you something? There is one moment that I enjoyed in this movie. And I think that may have been symbolic of the movie that S.J. Clarkson was trying to make. There is a sequence in the film that uses a Britney Spears song. And I think that for me was a clever execution of how to represent Madam Webb's powers. She can see into the future and she has these visions and something happens and then she has a chance to replay that moment and stop it from happening. Yeah. And all she has to go on is a Britney Spears song that is playing on the radio. So she knows that the bad shit happens when the song hits a certain beat and a certain moment and she needs to get to that place before it happens. And I'm like, that is a great use of pop music and a great use of this whole clairvoyant power that she has. It is a three to four minute sequence in a movie that's one hour and 40 minutes. But that was the only redeeming part of this entire film. That was the only part of the entire movie that made it look like anybody was using their real brain. Yes. There seemed like to be forethought in that. Yeah. This movie opens rough. There is a bunch of Peruvian spider people that looks like it was done by the same crew that did Chicha Man. It looks like a KRU production. Lah. That, that spider people bit. It was awful. The makeup was terrible. The costumes were awful. The way that the camera was moving in and out of Zoom. That camera was dog shit. That camera was dog shit. Look, I've got no problem with the costume design because, you know, they're jungle people, right? So they don't have access to latex. But it looked crap. That was it my problem. Crap. It looked cheap. It literally looked like the costume designer went to a bunch of Peruvians and said, hey, if I'm going to have to dress up as a spider person, what would I do? I don't think they paid for Peruvian consultants, my friend. I'm not talking about consultants. I'm talking about the Peruvian driver or the Peruvian villager that was around the corner from where they were shooting. <laughs> because it just looked like they strung up and tied up vines. and They didn't even try and make vines look cool. Anyway, nothing against the Peruvians. It's weird. This movie is so... Like, yeah. it falls at every step. Every attempt it tries at doing anything, it falls and fails. Yeah. We've all seen the... What is that brand? The juice brand that's got a photo of Madam Web that everybody was complaining was a spoiler? Ocean Spray. Ocean Spray, Yeah. That shot of her in that costume, right at the end. Is she even in the costume? No, it's a two-second flash, right? It's a real sort of that that thing you said earlier about having a forward premonition. And she's wearing the thing. And she's standing doing her hero pose with the three other women. And that's it. Not a spoiler. That was shot on a green screen somewhere like a 30-minute shoot because they needed a hero shot. That's all it was, right? That was probably an afterthought where they went, listen, we need a shot to close this movie and people are going to be pissed that they don't get to see any actual superheroes in this movie. So let's just give them that shot. And that's what I mean when I say pre-origin story because by the time this movie ends, she is not Madam Web and the three women aren't any kind of spider women because none of them have powers by the yeah. time this movie ends. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, what were they uh, thinking? Why were they not thinking is the real question. It is. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. However, I'm not going to lie, Vahe. I might watch it again. You go to hell. I only say that because I think I was so distracted the first time around with what the fuck moments, laughing out loud, and just completely losing my shit over what was happening on screen that I want to watch it again to re-dissect everything that is wrong with this film. Like, this is the kind of movie... What's the famous improv method? Yes, and. Yes, and. This is that, the movie. It's like, oh, look, this needs to happen. I'm getting on a flight to Peru. Boom, let's go. Can I also say, when that happened, as it was happening, I googled... International Airport Peru. Yeah. And I have to say, Peru is very modern. Lah. Even in 2003, where this movie is set. So, 
portraying Peru as nothing but Amazonian jungles <laughs> feels a little bit of a back step. In doing close to 500 episodes of this, we all know I don't do any research. But as I was sitting there and Cassie Webb turns to Ben Parker and says, look after the women, I need to go to Peru, I'll be back in a week. Really? Is a week enough to travel from New York to Peru into the jungles of Peru? And find a secret race of spider people. Find a secret race of spider people and make it back. In a week. Also, the whole idea that this action movie comes to a grinding halt because someone needs to go to Peru to do some research. At least if you take the girls with you and maybe that's how the girls get their powers, that's a different thing. No, there's a huge chase. People are looking for these individuals who have gone on the run, but wait, let's take a break for a week. I'm going to Peru. I'll be back. But also, also, but also, didn't they say that the police were looking for a woman who has kidnapped these three girls? They had a photo. So how did she get her passport? I get don't out know. Into internet, Why get you ask out? these kind of questions? It's not like 1970 where things weren't computerized. This was 2003. This is after 9-11. I was going to say. Where security is at an all-time high. And yet. Where you have to take your shoes off. This woman who kidnaps three young girls can make it out of the country and back in again. In a week. In a week. And find a secret race of spider people. All it took was her to just walk into the jungle and they show up. Yeah. Hey. You, lady, I knew you'd be back. I knew you'd be back. I told you that when you were a baby. You have no idea who I am. Oh, my God. And then wait, wait, wait. One final thing. One final thing before we end this podcast, because we've been going on for a while now. But which screenwriting genius thought to themselves, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invert the famous Spider-Man catchphrase. And instead of saying, with great power comes great responsibility. I'm going to say, with great responsibility comes great power. <laughs> Once you embrace the responsibility, you will embrace the power. Oh my God. Uma, can I just say, isn't that the catchphrase or the origin story of every corrupt politician? Yes, it is. With great responsibility comes great power to then get money into my bank account. Look, it wasn't cute. It wasn't fun. It wasn't smart. That line is terribly stupid. Uh, Madam Webb is now in Malaysian cinemas. It is an interesting watch because this kind of car crash, like we talk about a lot of bad movies. But this kind of car crash is rare. For something to drop the ball so hard is rare. And so we want to know what you think. You know how to reach out. Goggler MY, all of our social media feeds. You can also email us on podcast at goggler.my or send us a WhatsApp on the Goggler hotline 012-524-5208. Thank you so much for listening. This is the Goggler Podcast. <laughs>